There have been 12 times in the last 100 years where markets posted three years of 20% gains. This year hasn't finished yet. Um, globally, half of the time markets do even better in the following year. So I think next year is a year where the debate's going to be, is the bull cycle over or is it going to extend? I think it's going to create quite a lot of volatility in the first half, but I think GDP growth stronger, we have a dovish Fed, valuations are reasonable, so I think we end up exiting very strong. Why a lot of vol volatility in the first half then? Uh, part of it is um, mm. the Trump tariffs could get overturned. There is a possibility of a, an extended government shutdown. The nomination and then confirmation of a, a new Fed chair is going to take three months. That could be very controversial. I think all of that happens in the first half of next year. Yeah, and we have to keep in mind the equal weight S&P 500 PE is 17 times. Mm. It's lower than it was five years ago. So the market actually has derated in the last five years because of these black swans of the shutdown, inflation surge, fastest Fed hikes in history, et cetera. So actually the, the equal weighted market is, is cheaper. I don't, think, I don't think risk is actually that expensive. Really? Uh, I mean, yes and no, because uh, when you look at three-year stacked, it's still MAG-7. And so I, I think it makes sense to, to not just look at 2025 by itself, but how have stocks done since the end of 2022? To me, there's a lot of room for cyclicals to really outperform, including financials, because the ISM has been below 50 now for almost three years. That turns, hopefully turns up above 50 next year, and we get a pretty, I think what I consider a cyclical broadening of the market. To, to outperform tech? Yes, and Steph and I were talking about this, that I think tech earnings visibility is still good, but the, the multiple expansion story isn't as, doesn't have as much upside as industrials or financials or energy or even basic materials. It's funny, because you just bought more Meta. I did. Like this morning or yesterday, I did. right? This morning, yeah. Um, I still like it very much. It's still down 6% from its highs. I still think that they win from AI and what it's going to mean for their ad business and for their messaging business and customer apps business. The metaverse cost cuts are $5 billion in savings annualized. Gives, you, gives them $2 a share, again, annualized in earnings. I think this company can actually de deliver $36 to $38 a share by 2027. That puts this thing at 18 times earnings, and it's growing earnings at 20% and revenues at 26%. All that being said, so it's a big position, top five. All that being said, I am underweight other mags. I really only own Amazon, very small Microsoft. But I We're probably going to be obsessed with it for some time, right, Scott? I mean, the AI trade, for now at least, in the last few days, back on its feet. But none of the big questions actually went anywhere. This data from Similar Web, it gets at one of the most important questions in the whole trade, open AI versus the Google AI universe, not just on models, but across the stack and what each one represents. Now, from January to November of this year, open AI gave up a little bit of market share. Google, though, grew its market share from about 6% to 15%. This suggests that Google has the momentum and is finally converting distribution into real gains. Now, it's also quietly challenging NVIDIA on the hardware side with its custom AI chips known as TPUs, and that could impact the entire cost structure, what we know of it today in the AI trade. Now, going into next year, there will continue to be questions around whether OpenAI can meet its own ambitions and obligations while competing with an incumbent, Google, that controls the entire pipeline. Something else I want to mention, Scott, there's this really interesting debate going on at the very highest levels of AI right now. It's playing out on X between DeepMind's Demis Hassabas at Google and Jan LeCun, who just left Meta. These are two of the most prestigious people in AI. Hassabas is arguing that today's scaled models, they're already on a credible path to general AI, while LeCun is saying the current approach is a dead end without a new architecture. So if Hassabas is right, scale, chips, infrastructure, those things keep winning. But if LeCun is right, a lot of today's CapEx is going to look premature and the payoff gets pushed out. And that is really the central question on the bubble, right? Can we justify all of this spending? Yeah, yeah. And I guess maybe we don't know the answer for a while. Dee, thank you. Georgia Bosa, you know, Chris, you, you say that the tech bubble does not pass our litmus test. Yeah. Explain. So, again, it gets back to something like JP Morgan Banks, which is outperforming. You go back to late 90s and the banks really underperformed. Here, the banks are actually leading the way. Multiples that we're seeing, still not excessively high. You go back to late 90s, whether it's Oracle or Cisco, you're not seeing it. 
More importantly, let's go to can you fund these risky endeavors? If you go to the credit markets, anything not named Oracle, you can go out and you can still fund. And so this market is still rather healthy. Valuations are not high enough at this level. We don't see the frothiness that we saw back then. And the commercial aspect is so much better now than it was in the late 90s. So you think the Oracle uh, situation or issue or whatever is idiosyncratic to, to itself? That, that's what the market's telling you. The market's telling you that Oracle is very idiosyncratic. If you look at the credit spreads, if they came to the market, you'd be questioning how much can you bring to the market at what spreads. If anything else, any of the other hyperscalers came to the market, the market would probably not really think about it and digest more or less anything that they, they brought to the market. You think we continue to have dispersion among these stocks? If, you know, yes, Alphabet is up 63% year to date. NVIDIA is up 37. Microsoft is, a, you know, an underperformer slightly to the market, as is Meta, as is Apple, as is Amazon. Does this continue? Uh, Scott, I, I'm going to say something that's not very popular, but I still think they trade as a basket because they do all have linkages to the same theme, but at different points of time, some will lead versus the others. And so I have clients that do mean reversion among the MAG7, but I think that they're largely one complex. Okay. I hope we get mean reversion in the names that I own because Meta obviously has a ways to go, but Amazon does too. Out of all the MAG7s, that one to me has been the most surprising, that it just can't get out of its own way. Do you agree with what he said though, that you're going to get back to trading like a group because the, the stocks would suggest otherwise? Yeah. No, I actually think that at any given point you have a couple of leaders and a couple of laggards. And I think, the, I'm hoping, I'm betting on that the fundamentals are strong enough in the laggards that they will mean revert next year. That doesn't mean that Alphabet is going to fall 50 percent, but maybe it just trails for a little. Maybe it takes a pause. Same thing with Broadcom, as you know, I've said that before, that maybe it just takes a pause because it has crushed NVIDIA over the last year. And that's okay, but the fundamentals are still very, very strong, sound. Estimates are going higher. And when estimates go higher, no matter if these stocks take a pause, eventually the stock prices catch up with the earnings revisions. Last point to you. How, how will these trade? Um, we like the software space. We think it's more selective. It's not over. And we think the best risk reward is in the software space. All right, guys. Good holidays to everybody. Look forward to many conversations in the new year. By saying the fundamentals are, are, are going to atrophy. So where's the marginal buyer right. to come in and drive it much higher? And that's where that's where I struggle. So I still own it. I've said it's not one of my larger positions. I wish it had been, but it's not. But I think it's going to be fine. It's a permanent compounder. But make no mistake about it. As we see, there is competition on the horizon and actually readily available right now. Competition for some. Josh, what, what about Rascon, the, the case he makes that you, you could buy it here? Uh, yeah, and I, I listened to uh, Dan Ives um, say, saying much the same thing. Like the negative on NVIDIA or the thing that gave people pause was this idea that we're going to take application-specific integrated circuits like TPUs, substitute them at data centers for both training and inference, and all of a sudden there would be a more cost-effective way to avoid buying uh, Blackwells and then buying the next you know chip next year. Um, I'd have to see it to believe it. So far, it doesn't appear to be coming true. The backlog here for NVIDIA is as strong as it's ever been. And, uh, you know, I get that people were looking for a bear case on NVIDIA, and every one of them kept falling apart. First, they said Core Weave is a Ponzi. Then, you know, then they said, uh, you know, the stock would be unloaded um, because the earnings would disappoint, and that didn't happen. So it's like one bear case after another. And NVIDIA somehow just continues to find a way to defeat those bear cases with its actual results.